I think we're going to have, I, we're going to finish up on the truth in probably two to three weeks. And in talking and thinking and discussing, I think we're going to then go into a study on how to study the Bible before we venture into a study on the Holy Spirit because that would help us in a, 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 a bigger, deeper study on the Holy Spirit. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind and be praying about that as we continue in these studies. Uh, so, yeah, what is true? John chapter 18, verse 37 through 38. Pilate is asking that question kind of uh, in the sense of uh, what does truth matter when you're between a rock and a hard place? Uh, you know, if, if for him, in trying to make this decision about Jesus, uh, whether to crucify him or not, if, if Caesar doesn't kill me, the Jews are going to kill me, what difference does it make? Well, you still got to deal with God in the end. You still got your soul that you're going to have to give an account for. Doesn't matter what Caesar would do to you. It doesn't matter what these Jews will do to you. It matters what's going to happen for eternity. Now, we haven't really explored it to that depth in this study. We've just been looking at what is true. So today, as we bring this or start the concluding aspect of it, the Bible teaches us that truth is essential to salvation. And we're going to find out. We're not going to get to heaven by accident. Nobody's going to get to heaven by accident. Now, people will get to heaven by innocence. Innocence. I believe fully that babies, children who die before they reach an age of accountability, before sin is accountable to them, that they go to heaven. And, and sometimes uh, people will grow into adulthood live a very long time but never reach an age of accountability because uh, of mental process of something that's not their fault. I believe they're innocent. God will take care of them because he is a merciful God. But that's not the case for everybody. And ignorance does not necessarily lead to innocence. And especially willful ignorance. People who just don't want to know. I don't want to know. What I don't know won't hurt me. Well, you don't know if there's poison in that food. You know, it, it could hurt you pretty badly. So, uh, pretty badly. May not be the best choice of words. It could hurt you badly. So, again, the Bible teaches us the truth is essential to salvation's fun foundational, it's fundamental, it's got to be there, and that's what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Now, he's talking to the Jews here, the Jews who believed on him, but it's going to uh, translate out to us also. It's important for us even in our time today. Now, um, and I lost my thought there for just a moment. I, I've talked before, and I think, I'm pretty sure I've talked about it here. But remember, when, where Jesus went, there were massive crowds that followed him wherever he went. And we're going to see from in the sermon this morning, at one time, there were 5,000 men, plus there were women and children that followed him out to the wilderness to hear him preach and teach, okay? But in those 5,000, not all 5,000 of those people were disciples. 
of those 5,000, some of them were there for different reasons. There were some disciples, there were some people there that wanted to see a show, wanted to see a miracle, were just interested, hey, what's going on? Some were there to criticize, some were there to make trouble. All kinds of people were there. So, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, but maybe they believed in him, but they weren't really ready or had not made a commitment to him. He said to them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. All right? So how do we define disciples is kind of what we're going to look at, but it's going to give us a good study on discipleship. It's going to give us a good study on truth. It's going to give us a good study on salvation. It's going to give us a good study on how we put things together as we're looking at words, uh, concepts through the scriptures. And here's, uh, let me flip back and forth here. Here's a chart. I couldn't get it all, all really on one page to justify it. So we're going to have two pages. Right? Defining disciples from John chapter 8, verse 31, 32. Because again, just because there were people there who believed on him, there were a lot of people there who probably didn't. But he's talking, especially trying to get the attention to the ones who believe. Look, just believing may not be enough. You have to go a little further. So, but just look at this center line, and you will find John chapter 8, verses 131 32. Jesus said to the Jews who believed on him, If you abide in my word, in brackets, then, because it's there, but you have to supply it, right? It's an if then statement. The then is not there, but you know it's there. You are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That is Jesus' statement to these Jews who believed in him. Also, it will be to us who believe in him. Now, what do we do logically to negate that? word not. And once you put the word not in it, that just sets the two things apart to where you can make an argument logically. And when I say argument, not the argument like who burned the beans. It's, it's, a, it's about a logical argument looking for truth. So let's go down through this side the logical antithesis. This would be the thesis in the middle, what Jesus said. This is the anti antithesis of it. If you do not abide in my word. Now, who's he talking to? Jews. The Jews who what? They believed in him. They believed in him. Let that sink in. They believed in him. If you do not abide in my word, but I believe in you. He said, if I believe in you, I'll be saved. See where it's going? See where it's going? How many people out here in the world today? You just believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Listen to what Jesus is saying. Use the reasoning, logic, and you see what's going on. If you abide in my word, or if you do not abide in my word, you are not truly my disciples. Is that logically true? Yes. And you will not know the truth, 
If we do not abide in the word, we do not know the truth. Why? Because the truth is where? It's in the word. It's not in what we think. It's not in what we think we think. It's not in what we believe we think. And it's not in what we think we believe. Where's the truth? It's in the word. That's vitally important. Say, if you do not abide in my word, you are not truly my disciples. You will not know the truth. And the truth will not set you free. What does John 8.34 say? Someone want to pull that up? Okay. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Is slavery freedom? No. So, if, if sin is the same as slavery and truth has something to do with freedom, then we see that truth is essential to freedom or salvation. There's a true message there. How about Acts chapter 8 and verse 23? Go ahead, ladies. Dark, very easy one. It says, For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And iniquity is sin. Bound is, again, slavery. Why? Because they would not accept the truth about Jesus Christ and about what the gospel message was teaching. So they were still, what? Slaves to sin. Okay, so... Let's jump on over here for a moment. So they were in bondage to sin and death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. The wages of sin. It's what we earn because of sin. Why? Because we've rejected something else, right? We've rejected the free gift, but the free gift comes by what? Knowing the truth, understanding the truth, believing the truth, and obeying or abiding in that truth. Uh, John 8, 34 through 36. Jesus answered him, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Wait, 35. Okay. And the slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If the Son makes you free, okay? So, how does the Son make us free? Through the truth. And the truth is the gospel, right? But that's contained in the Word. Uh, it, and there need to be some debate on but the Word especially the New Testament, the gospel is that truth of how a person is saved from their sins. Okay, let's go over here uh, to the not section again. Okay, if you, do, if you do not continue in my word, you're not my disciples indeed. You'll not know the truth. You'll not be set free. 
Eternal destruction, 2 Thessalonians 1 8. And flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Okay. If you remember 1 and 2 Thessalonians, because there are a lot of people who like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because it talks about Jesus coming and taking home the righteous. And that's where the, uh, many apply the false doctrine of the rapture. He's going to come, he's going to take the, the righteous back with him and leave all the rest here for a while, you know. No. But 2 Thessalonians, first chapter, explains it. Because the question in 1 Thessalonians was, well, what's going to happen after we die? Uh, you know, if, if somebody dies before Jesus comes back, uh, have they lost hope? No, he's going to raise the dead, and then the ones who are left here are going to be changed and go on. But he's not talking about the dead, and especially the evil dead, so the next question becomes, well, what about the evil dead? So in the second letter, he addresses that, and he addresses it in the first chapter. So what's he going to do when he comes back? Well, he's going to raise the dead, all right? With him to heaven, the unrighteous, in flaming fire, he's going to take vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're talking about. But see, that's where our hope is. Our hope of eternal salvation is in it. if you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Free from what? free from sin and death, and give you eternal salvation. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't Peter basically saying the same thing that Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32? but he's talking about disciples here. If you continue in my word by adding these things to your life, continually, when you've added all these things, start over again and add some more. And uh, I forget the word that was used there, but the King James says, for if you do these things, you will never fall. Can a disciple fall from grace? You bet, because right there you've got the proof text from Jesus and from Peter who understood perfectly. If you do these things, so that's why it's very important. The Word of God, the truth is essential to our salvation. So we keep studying, we keep digging, we keep learning. And yes, 
you know it's an adventure. It's like Indiana Jones. You dig around in some old dead stuff and you come up with some living stuff. Some stuff that shows why we're, we're, we're living and continuing on. Okay? Uh, let me see. Uh, let me go back to here for a moment. All right. Now, in defining the word disciple, or at least looking at it and digging it in. And when we get to um, how to study the Bible, you know, there, there, there are different ways to look at the Bible and, and, and look at things and, and learn truths from the Bible. Have you ever heard of stringing pearls? You've heard of the concept? Did you, did you, did you have, have a book in the Bible? In Bible study? Oh, no. I thought you were talking about really stringing <laughs> pearls. I was like, yeah, I've done it. Okay, but... <coughs> yeah. Sorry. And stringing pearls. Okay. And what you do, you start with a word or a phrase, and, and it's like stringing pearls. And then you find a, a, a verse, and, and then you find another verse that, that amplifies it or says basically the same thing. You put another one. You can do it with a concordance that, you know, that's basically what they're doing. All the verses in the Bible, if you get an exhaustive concordance, all the verses in the Bible that use this word in the English, you can get them for the Greek, you can get them for the Hebrew, you can get whatever. And you string so that you can line them all up and you can see everywhere and read every verse that this this word is used in the Bible. It's called stringing pearls. Because you're like putting very important, valuable things together. And that's what you want to do. That's that's an inductive study, which is good. So we want to know, well. Before I forget, let's drop back and look at the gift. What is a gift? When it's used in a phrase, if and then. Maybe or maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. It's conditional, isn't it? It's conditional. So it's conditional. If you do this, then here's what's going to happen. And then you got the converse of it. If you don't do this, then here's what's going to happen. So anytime you see an if, remember there are conditions to it. And, and that's as we're studying, never forget that. Because it doesn't matter what language you're studying it in uh, logically. That's going to be true. You have to take the Bible for what it says. Now, so let's string some pearls for Christians, okay? Uh, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Well, what are disciples? Followers. Followers? Well, uh, there were people who followed. Um, let's start with followers. Uh, did uh, did everybody who followed Jesus out to the wilderness was he, were they disciples? Well, following his word, one that follows his word. Okay. Could our let me put it uh, and please understand what I'm doing well, here. Sure. Okay. Are followers a subset of disciples or? Disciples, a subset of followers. Followers would be the subset of disciples. I think Lynn thinks it's different. I don't know really the answer that. <laughs> I'm thinking. What do you think, Lynn? Me? I think it's the other one. Yeah, I, I kind of got that. Which is narrower? Which is the followers? Disciples being a subset of the followers. 
we have a bunch of followers. We have a whole bunch of followers. But and a few of those would be disciples. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, continue. Believers, okay, are all believers disciples? No, so we're in that same, and are all followers believers? No, so now, now you've got followers, the greater, and now you've got believers, but some of those are believers, and some of those believers are actually disciples. Okay. Now we're going to leave subsets and we're going to get into coordinates or even synonyms. Okay. How about saints? Well, first of all, let's go back. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for the whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Okay. In Antioch, the disciples, that the followers, that's the question. Is that the followers? In Antioch, the disciples, is that the followers? It is the subset of the followers. Is that the believers? Is that the Christian? Or disciples? The disciples were called Christians, not the believers. Right? Not the followers. Not the crowd. Not all people. See how we're narrow nar 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 that down? Do you understand? They did. Okay. All right. So the disciples were called Christians. Who called them Christians? We're going to have to stop here after we get this one done. Who called them Christians? Okay. This is where it's important to go back to the original languages. Originally, in the Greek, this is a Greek word, so, the word kramatizo is used twice in the New, Test New Testament. Both times when it's used, it's God speaking. This isn't the church calling themselves Christians. This isn't the word, world, the enemies of Christ calling his followers Christians. This is God calling the followers of Christ. But who is it? Disciples. Okay? So we'll pick up there next week. Okay? Do you have any questions I can answer in a, like 30 seconds? Okay. Thank you all for your time and